Hello and a very good morning. You're watching the Breakfast News on Rajya Sabha Television with me, Frank Pereira. As always, let's begin with the latest headlines. Goa Chief Minister Manohar Parikar says that the BJP has asked him to accept any assignment at the centre expansion and reshuffling of the Union Cabinet expected on Sunday. Nitish Kumar hints at a merger of the Samajwadi Party, RJD, Janata Dal United and Janata Dal Secular Left Front, notably left out of the Third Front meeting. Navy vessel sinks during an exercise off the Vishakhapatnam coast, another in a long list of Navy mishaps over the last year. Political chaos deepens in Libya as uh, the country's apex court sets aside the constitutional validity of the newly elected parliament. And an unbeaten maiden ton by Ambati Raidu puts India 2-0 up in the ODI series against Sri Lanka. Our top focus on the bulletin this morning. It's been more than 150 days since the Modi government came to power and uh, this weekend we are likely to see the first cabinet reshuffle. Sources say that Goa Chief Minister Manohar Parikar is likely to be the new defence minister. Parikar has admitted being offered an assignment at the centre, though he did not come out clearly on whether he would get the defence portfolio. Arun Jaitley currently holds both defence and finance. Party President Amit Shah talked to, in the, talked to me in the morning, told me to accept any assignment which will be given by the Prime Minister. The second part is prerogative of the Prime Minister and therefore I will not like to comment on it. Meanwhile, reports say that the government has unofficially conveyed to the president that there will be an oath ceremony for new ministers on Sunday. An official intimation is likely by tomorrow. There's also widespread speculation on other key changes, including induction of another Shiv Sena MP into the cabinet, alongside the tussle over the alliance in Maharashtra. The TDP may get another ministry as well. Some ministers of state are likely to be elevated to cabinet rank. Prime Minister Modi took oath in May this year with a slim team of 45 ministers. This this will be the first cabinet expansion. There are currently 22 cabinet members and another 22 ministers of state, including 10 with independent charge. Joining me for a chat uh, this morning on this very subject is senior journalist Saroj Nagi. Good morning, uh, Saroj, and thank you for joining us on the program. Uh, let's talk about this uh, cabinet expansion. Now, much talked about uh, cabinet expansion. It's expected to take place on Sunday, which is just a couple of days away from now. Uh, is there really a need for a cabinet expansion, do you think? Oh, yes. I think there's a tremendous need for it. Even if you take Narendra Modi's promise of uh, minimum government and maximum governance, you have to strike a balance between government and, uh, gov uh, government and governance. There is at present an imbalance in that. You know, a, a number of ministers have been saddled with several portfolios. Mm. Uh, some key ministers have been, han have been handling two key portfolios, like Arun Jaitley, as yes. you mentioned. Now, you have to slice off these portfolios mm. now and hand them over to someone else so that at least the governance level is also addressed. Right now, there's also another problem in governance that one, if you talk to ministers, you get to know, is that most of them haven't even been given the entire staff that is required yes. for a ministry, yes. which means the, now you have lesser staff, more workload, which means, in effect, that governance suffers, although it's not evident at the moment, but sooner or later, it's going to become mm -hmm. evident. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is whether you need a, a as I said, these are the two main issues. But besides that, if you club for instance, defense and finance, you've got the budget coming up, you've got incursions on the border, so you require a full-fledged defense minister in the yes. first place. You can't expect the same man to address these two huge problems which the country is facing. And if you look at it, these are the two major problems, addressing the finance, your current account deficit, your fiscal deficit, uh, boosting growth, you know, giving a boost to manufacturing yes. sector. So these are some key challenges before the Modi government, and he has to address. 
address them. And this can be addressed essentially by getting some more people into the cabinet. Now, he can do that by balancing government and governance. Mm. He need not go up to the upper cap of 15%, which gives you about 81 ministers, ministers at the yes, central yes, government. Yes. So right now, he said, as you have 45, including himself, and this talk about, you know, this speculation, actually, nobody knows what he has on his mind, mm. the speculation that there'd be about 10 to 20. Yes. I mean, the figure ranges between that, 10 and 20. 10 yes. and 20. Yes. So it could be anything between, the, between you, that. You know, all the focus leading up to today has been on Manohar Parikar, whether Absolutely. he's going to be the de next defense minister or not. You know, if he's elevated uh, to a cabinet rank minister, there's going to be a major void that's going to be left behind in Goa. Now, who's really going to fill up that void is another big question for the yes, BJP to tackle, think, isn't it? Yes, but I think Modi had to take make this difficult choice about whether you want Goa with a good chief minister, which um, Parikar proved to be, or you want your central government to perform very well. Now, the, the substitute of Manohar Parikar could be anybody there who would probably grow into his job because mm. there are some uh, experienced people in the Goa government as well. But there's talk about, if you link it to the cabinet reshuffle, there's talk about also of some ministers being asked to quit. Hmm. For instance, there's also talk about Shripat Nayak being sent to Goa as chief yes. minister. Yes. And his vacancy would then come up in the central government, which would perhaps be filled by some other people. Now, there's another major problem in this at the governance level right now is that the government is uh, you ha uh, Modi has to streamline his government in terms of giving it social balance, regional balance, and also streamlining lining performance of the ministers and weeding out certain ministers who are not performing yes, well. Yes, that's because, going to be extremely important. Now, yes. this is not just a cabinet expansion, it's going to be a cabinet reshuffle as well. So are we Absolutely. going to see a major reshuffle as far as portfolios are concerned within the present ministers? Yes, I mean, if you have a defence minister, you're also revamping the CCS, mm, the Cabinet mm, Committee on Security, mm. because the defence minister is a member of the Cabinet Committee yes. of Security. And Arun Jaitley as finance minister and defence minister was part of that. So you'll have a new face in the Cabinet Committee of Security also, no matter who the defence minister is. Now, if he plans to reshuffle his portfolios, at best what he can do is perhaps move Rajnath Singh from home to defence and put in Parikar there in mm, home. Mm. But that would be too much of a reshuffle, yes, I think, in the yes. sense, you know, because Rajnath has been given five months to settle into his new uh, into his new portfolio, and suddenly you move him out and put him in another place. But I don't know what he, uh, exactly he's thinking, but these are the possibilities before indeed, him. Indeed, several possibilities as far as yes. uh, cabinet reshuffle and cabinet expansion is concerned, all will probably be revealed on Sunday. Thank you so much, Saroj, for joining us on the program this morning and uh, sharing Thank your you. perspectives on that very subject. Moving on now. Now, the Samajwadi Party, Janta Dal United, uh, uh, Rashtriya Janta Dal and uh, Janta Dal Secular have uh, resolved to work together as one unit. Leaders of these parties met in New Delhi yesterday and resolved to have a common stand on important issues like black money, price rise and unemployment. Interestingly, the left front which had uh, initiated the alliance was not invited. Aaj, aaj, राजनैतिक तौर पर यह सहमति बनी है कि हम लोगों को मिलना है एक साथ काम करना है और हमने इसलिए कहा कि यह जो एक जुटता है यह एकात की तरफ भी बढ़ सकता है एक पार्टी की तरफ भी बढ़ सकता है ओल्ड फोर्स टर्न्ड फ्रेंड्स आर नाउ लुकिंग एट वन बिग फैमिली द हिंट दैट द जनता परिवार इज लुकिंग टू रीग्रुप एज वन एंटिटी वाज क्लियर एट द मीटिंग ऑफ थर्ड फ्रंट लीडर्स एट एसपी चीफ मुलायम सिंह यादव्स रेजिडेंस इन दिल्ली थर्सडे as of now the parties agreed to work together as a group in parliament inhone kaha tha ki hum 100 din mein kala dhan laenge aur ye dhan la ke bole the ki 15 15 lakh rupya hoga hisab pratyek bhartiya nagrik ke khata mein hum jama karenge ab ye girgir ke tarah ye rang badal diye the meeting comes months after an attempt to form a non congress non bjp front ahead of the lok sabha polls which failed the left parties which were at the helm of affairs at that time were not invited I do not know what they mean by that front. Whether they mean uh, inviting all non-BJP, non-Congress parties, that also it is not clear because uh, they have not invited uh, left parties. However, Nitish Kumar made it clear that these parties are open for a dialogue with like-minded parties to try and expand this alliance. 
The meeting is also being seen as an attempt by these parties to remain politically relevant after their poor show in the Lok Sabha polls. With inputs from Ravindra Sharan, Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Meanwhile, the BJP has formed a pre-poll alliance uh, with uh, the All Jharkhand Students Un Union and the Lok Jan Shakti Party, a decision that has not gone down too well with the BJP state unit. State leaders believe that the Lok Jan Shakti Party has no strong support base. The AJSU too is not viewed favorably. Our correspondent Shamsundar files this special report on why then the party's central leadership still went ahead with this. The Bharatiya Janta Party has given eight seats to the AJSU and one to the Lok Jan Shakti Party in Jharkhand. Senior leaders of the party's state unit are said to be unhappy over these alliances. In Maharashtra, the BJP fought the elections alone after ending its 25-year-long alliance with the Shiv Sena. In Haryana too, it let go of the Haryana Janhit Congress. The win in both these states gives the party confidence despite the reservations of its leaders in Jharkhand. महाराष्ट्र में भी छोटे दलों को हमने साथ लिया था राष्ट्रीय सा, सामाजिक पक्ष पार्टी रामदास अठवाले की पार्टी ऐसे जो छोटे दल थे जो विभिन्न सा, उनको सामाजिक समीकरणों को बना सकते थे उन सब को हमने अपना साझेदार बनाया था बिहार में भी हमने उपेंद्र कुशवाहा के दल को साझेदार बनाया उत्तर प्रदेश में भी बड़ा दल होते हुए हमने अपना दल को बनाया तो ऐसा नहीं हम पूरी तरीके से राजनीति में अन्य दलों और विचारों को नकारते हैं लेकिन जो प्रतिबद्धता के साथ आकर के सुशासन की राजनीति में हमारा साथ दे सके और स्वाभाविक साथी के तौर पे उनसे हम गठबंधन भी प्रदेश की जरूरत के हिसाब से करते हैं a majority verdict has proved elusive in Jharkhand so far, but BJP is confident that its strategy in Maharashtra and Haryana will work in Jharkhand too. Look, the society of all the social forces is to bring together to Jharkhand in Jharkhand, to establish the government in Jharkhand, to establish the government in Jharkhand, and 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 to establish the government in Jharkhand. After a majority verdict at the centre, BJP wants to establish itself as the country's biggest political outfit. On one hand, it is trying to make a foothold in states like Tamil Nadu, Kerala and West Bengal and on the other, it is refusing to play second fiddle to any other party. After Maharashtra and Bihar, BJP now wants to play a stellar role in Punjab too, out of the shadow of Akali Dal. For this very reason, smaller regional parties are very important for them. Sham Sundar's report for Rajya Sabha TV. Moving on, now news of yet another Indian Navy accident, one of many over the last few months has come to light. One person was killed and another four are reported missing after an Indian Navy's uh, torpedo recovery vessel sank 30 nautical miles south of Ishakapatnam on Thursday. The mishap took place at about 8 p.m. last night when the vessel was on a mission to recover practice torpedoes fired by fleet ships during a routine exercise. It started sinking after there was flooding in one of its compartments. 23 people on board were rescued by the search and rescue ships. Till late in the night, hectic search and rescue operations were in progress to find the missing personnel. The 110-ton TRV A-72 was commissioned in February 1983. The accident is one of many that the Navy has witnessed over the last year, including INS Sindurakshak and uh, INS Sinduratna. Navy Chief Admiral R.K. Dhawan took over as the Chief of the Naval Staff on April 17 this year after his predecessor D.K. Joshi quit following a series of accidents. Meanwhile, the Met Department has issued a bad weather alert for states along the Bay of Bengal coast. The IMD said a depression over central Bay of Bengal has strengthened into a deep depression which might fan up as a cyclonic storm today. Rough seas will get kicked up to create hazards for boaters during this time with uh, the wind speeds reaching up to 90 km per hour. If a cyclone indeed shapes up, it would be named Ashoba, a Sri Lankan name. The system is likely to cause heavy rainfall at many places over Andaman during the next 24 hours. However, IMD says that the tropical cyclone is likely to abate before moving inland. Well, it's time for a short break now, but still to come on the show, Prime Minister Modi tweets about his expectations from his Australia visit. That and much more on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Well, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be leaving for a three-nation tour early next week. Ahead of his visit, he took to Twitter, outlining his expectations from the tour. Modi said that he will be looking for strong regional ties at the ASEAN summit in Myanmar. He also said that his visit to Australia would be both special and historic. Here's more. Starting from November 11th, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will begin his three-day visit to Myanmar, Australia and Fiji. Apart from meeting top leaders, Modi will be attending ASEAN Summit and G20 Summit during his nine-day tour. Ahead of the visit, Modi took to microblogging site Twitter, laying out his expectations. He hoped for a strong ASEAN with India playing a crucial role. Modi will also attend G20 Summit in Australia, which he feels is a great platform to showcase opportunities India has to offer to the world. You can't get 2% global growth if all the 20 countries don't contribute. And it is a reality that there are some economies which are contracting, like Europe. There are some economies who are struggling and there are some economies which are expanding. And I think India's contribution to this 2% economic growth will be quite substantial. The Prime Minister is also looking forward to his bilateral tour to Australia, which he termed both historic and special. He will be the first Indian PM to visit Australia in 28 years. Modi will also be interacting with Indian community in Australia. Reports suggest that Indian diaspora has planned a Madison Square Garden like welcome for the PM. We are expecting more than 17,000 people in, in the venue itself because the capacity cannot hold everyone inside the venue. So yes, it would be very special. Modi will also be meeting Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott for the second time in three months. Abbott visited India in September during which the two countries inked the Civil Nuclear Cooperation Agreement. With inputs from Akhilesh Suman, Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, let's now take a look at what's lined up for the day ahead today in our special segment, The Day Ahead. Well, Varnasi is all set to welcome Prime Minister Narendra Modi as he will be visiting his Lok Sabha constituency today for the first time since he took charge in May. Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister Akhilesh Yadav will also be present in Varnasi to welcome him. Tight security arrangements have been put in place. He is expected to inaugurate several projects including adopting a village under the MP model village scheme. President Pranab Mukherjee will leave for Bhutan today for a two-day state visit, the first visit by a top Indian leader in 26 years. He'll be meeting the top leadership there, including the King of Bhutan and Prime Minister Sering Thogbe, along with the other ministers. In an interview to the Bhutan Broadcasting Service, the President had said that India will continue to assist Bhutan in its economic development, calling Bhutan special to India. Senior officials from India and uh, the Arab League will meet in New Delhi today to boost bilateral relations between the two countries. They will hold discussions on a wide range of topics including trade, investment and energy. The meeting is uh, taking place as per the Memorandum of Cooperation signed between two sides in December 2013. The Telecom Commission will meet today to discuss the Spectrum auction as many of the telecom licenses are set to expire soon. The auction is expected to take place in February next year. The Telecom Regulatory Authority of India has also recommended a 10% hike in reserve price for 1,800 MHz band Spectrum auction compared to the last winning price in the February 2014 sale. Amid speculation, a union cabinet reshuffle, Goa Chief Minister Manohar Parikar is meeting BJP legislators today in Panaji. The meeting is expected to take place in the Chief Minister's official residence. Party sources said that there could be a formal communication by Parikar about his conversation with Prime Minister Modi on the cabinet reshuffle and eventually choosing a successor. Moving on now, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that his country is keen on Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Make in India initiative. Netanyahu said that Israel is willing to discuss transfer and development of technologies with India. Home Minister Rajnath Singh is on a visit to Israel, the first Indian minister to visit that country. Singh's visit comes close on the heels of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's meeting with Netanyahu on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly in New York in September. Here's a look now at some of the news making stories from across the globe in our segment World Wrap. 
Libya's highest court has ruled that general elections held in June were unconstitutional and that the country's parliament and government which resulted from that vote should be dissolved. The development further deepened the rift in the politically divided Libya which has been mired in months-long clashes and turmoil. The Supreme Constitutional Court handed down the ruling in the capital Tripoli which is controlled by Islamist allied militias. The United States said that it conducted airstrikes against the so-called uh, Khorasan Group, an Al-Qaeda-linked militant faction based in Syria. The U.S. says that the group is plotting attacks in Europe or the United States. The airstrikes hit terrorists and destroyed or severely damaged several Khorasan Group vehicles and buildings. A French jihadist is reportedly killed in this particular incident. The U.S. military said that it believes the buildings were used for meetings and uh, making bombs and training. Riots erupted in central Brussels after more than a lakh workers marched and demonstrated against austerity reforms. Police used water cannons and tear gas when hundreds of protesters began overturning cars, setting off fireworks, torching bins and throwing items such as paving stones at officers. Many of those involved in clashes were dockers. Police said that they cleared the area by late afternoon. The protests marked the start of a month-long campaign against Belgium's a new centre-right coalition which wants to extend the pension age from 65 to 67, contain wages and cut public services. Let's now take a look at uh, the global stock markets. US stocks closed higher on Thursday on an indication that the European Central Bank would uh, take more public action if needed to boost a struggling Eurozone economy. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 69.94 points or 0.4% to end the trading at 17,544. Standard & Poor's 500 Index gained 7.64 points or 0.38% to close at 2031. The Nasdaq Composite added 17.75 points or 0.38% to finish at 4,638. Gold prices fell by 0.64% or 430 rupees to close at 25,797 per 10 grams as speculators trimmed positions amid a weak global trend. Silver also recorded a steep fall of 900 rupees or 0.29% to close 35,050 per kilogram on poor offtake by industrial units and coin makers. Asian stocks opened high today after a drop in American jobless claims bolstered optimism in the world's largest economy before a government report on employment. Japan's Nikkei is up by 101.13 points or 0.60% at 16,893 at the start of today's trading. Hong Kong's Hang Seng rose 41.68 points or 0.18% to 23,607 at the start of trading today. Well, we'll slip into another short break now. All the sports updates on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Rajasabha Television. Well, India thrashed Sri Lanka by six wickets uh, in the second ODI at Ahmedabad on Thursday. Indian batsman Amrithi Raidu scored a maiden unbeaten century on debut. Batting first after winning the toss, Sri Lanka set India a modest target of 275 runs in 50 overs with half centuries by skipper Angelo Matthews and Kumar Sangakara steadying the innings. India were off to a brilliant start right from the word go with Umesh Shadar dismissing Kusal Pereira in the first over. For India, Raidu scored scored 10 unbeaten 121 and Shikhar Dhawan continued his uh, good uh, run scoring form who scored 79 runs. The victory at Motera now takes uh, India to the top of the ODI rankings. India leads 2-0 in the five match series. Finishing off the match with a lovely stroke over. Let's now bring you up to date with the other news making stories from the world of sports and our sports beat. Five-time world champion Vishwanathan Anand has termed his opponent at the World Chess Championship Magnus Carlsen as tenacious. Grandmaster Vishwanathan Anand has played six World Chess Championship matches since 2007 and he will be up against Magnus Carlsen in Sochi. 
uh, who had uh, defeated the Indian legend in Chennai last year. The 44-year-old Anand has expressed confidence ahead of the 12-game match starting on Saturday. The Kerala Blasters beat FC Goa 1-0 in the battle of the bottom two sides in the Indian Super League on Thursday. After a goalless first half, Salgaonka striker Milagres Gonzalez made it uh, count for Kerala with a left footer that found the net in the 64th minute. The win allowed Kerala to climb two spots to fifth in the league table while Goa remained at the bottom of the chart. Eight women boxers including unmarried and juniors who are set to compete at the World Championships in Korea next week have been subjected to pregnancy tests by Boxing India. Sports medicine specialist Dr. Chandra has uh, hit out at the Boxing India's decision saying that uh, IBA rules clearly state that junior boxers need not be subjected to any tests and only a non-pregnancy declaration is enough. Boxing India President Sandeep uh, Jajodia who defended the decision to conduct the test, said that it's all right. Eden Hazard won, the, uh, uh, won and then missed a late penalty as Chelsea were held to a 1-1 draw in a breathless encounter with Maribor. Jose Mourinho fielded a strong team against the side who crumbled to a 6-0 defeat at the Stamford Bridge two weeks ago with the Petr Cech and Didier Drogba both starting. Finally, curtains came down on uh, this year's edition of the Pushkar Camel Fair yesterday. We leave you with some glimpses of the event that has become a draw for people from around the world. Have a nice day.